Hi, Kinesiology 3030. This is our review lecture for biomechanical concepts. Um, so if you missed anything or just wanted to review, um, here's your opportunity. I'm just going to go through the entire lecture. Um, so if you need to skip around, feel free to. Um, but this is your resource to help you out. Okay, so biomechanics is the study of mechanical principles applied to living things. Um, and in our class, we use human biomechanics because this is kinesiology. We're, we're dealing with human movement and the forces that cause that movement or um, those actions that we can perform and what's causing those actions. Um, when we study these concepts, these biomechanical concepts, we have two different realms. We have statics and dynamics. A statics is the study of um, constant motion, okay, so constant velocity, no acceleration, no change in motion, so um, no change in direction of motion, no change in speed of motion. Um, so everything is constant, everything is kind of in balance or within, we within equilibrium. Dynamics, on the other hand, is when there is a change in motion, so the study of systems with acceleration, so with a change in speed, a change in direction, um, something is changing about that object's motion or that person's motion um, because there are unequal forces acting on that person or that body or that um, object. So with unequal forces means we're going to cause a change in motion or cause acceleration. Um, when we're studying these, we look at them through the realm of kinematics and kinetics. Kinematics is motion. Okay, so this is how we describe motion um, in reference to time. So things like displacement, position, velocity, acceleration, all of the spatial factors and the temporal factors, so the space and time, the position and the time, the change in position over time, the change in displacement over time, the velocity change. Um, so what we're looking at here is motion. Kinetics is the study of the forces that cause that motion or um, stop that motion or maintain that motion. Um, whatever forces are being applied to the body. So think of kinematics as what we can see and kinetics as what's causing what we're seeing. Um, we'll also go through kind of different mechanisms, different things. We'll talk about mechanical advantage, talk about levers, um, and we'll talk about our, our principles or our, our laws of motion. Okay. Um, so when this all comes down to what we're dealing with, we're looking at forces, and motion and how the forces are causing that motion. Okay, if we're looking at how we cause that motion, we'll use different um, mechanical principles like levers, um, which is an axis and a rigid bar that's going to rotate um, wheels and axles and pulleys. These are different mechanical structures that we will use as people. Um, and that may occur within the body or outside of the body to cause motion or stop motion or maintain motion. Um, the one we'll talk about for our class is levers. Um, levers is, are composed of a rigid bar, okay, so a, a stiff bar that is rotating around an axis or a fulcrum. Um, when it comes to the components of that lever system, we always have an axis when it comes to a lever system. There's always a force that we apply they are the motive force. Think of it as like our muscle force um, or our personal force, our motive force, um, the force that we're applying to cause motion. The resistance force, which is the external environment um, or, or what's resisting the force that we're applying to that lever. And then there's also the lifting arm and the resistance arm or the motive arm and resistive arm. The motive arm is the length of the lever from the axis to the application of the motive force. Okay, the resistive arm is the distance between the axis and where the resistance force is being applied to that lever. That lever distance is important because that, imp or that changes the torque that's being applied on the system. Okay, we'll get into that in mechanical advantage. We'll talk about how the motive arm and the resistive arm length affects our ability to cause motion or ability to resist motion and how easy or difficult it is to um, create motion or maintain motion. Okay, some examples of levers, think about your door, um, the hinges would be the axis, the handle is the point of application of our motive force, and somewhere kind of in the middle towards the end of that door would be the resistance force or the, um, the inertia of that door. 
um, the object's resistance to change in motion or where its center of mass is located. Um, we can also look at things like the wrench example. Okay, we use a wrench um, whenever we're trying to turn a nut or a bolt. Um, longer wrenches are easier to use or they, they cause more torque because we have a longer lever arm to our resistance or to our motive force, um, which is our hand applying that force. Um, and that force we apply a distance away from the axis creates torque. Okay, some other examples using a hammer to pull out a nail, um, using scissors or pliers, you're applying a force on one side and then there's a resistive force on the opposite side of that axis or something like a stapler where we apply force to one end of the stapler to cause rotation around the axis of the base. So these are some other examples of torque outside of the body. Within the body, our joints are the point at which that rotation is occurring and our bone is the lever. Our bones are levers and our joints are axes if you want to think of them in general terms. Okay. Um, and this turning effect that happens with our lever and our forces that are being applied and rotation around the axis is called torque, torque or moment. Um, these are descriptions of rotational forces or angular forces. Um, and when we're calculating torque or determining torque, torque is the product or the multiplication of the force applied perpendicular to the lever and the distance that lever is from the axis. Okay, so the point of application, that distance that we talked about earlier, the lever arm or the resistive arm, that distance multiplied by the force that is applied perpendicular to that point. Um, that gives us our torque. So whenever we cause motion at our joints, our muscles produce a force or a motive force against the bone, which is applied a distance away from the joint center or the axis of rotation which causes motion or causes a torque at that limb, that torque causes motion, or that rotational force causes rotational motion. Okay, um, we can organize these levers in different ways, um, but we always have these three components. We always have an axis, a motive force, and a resistive force. Okay? And how we arrange them determines how easy or difficult, okay, so how much force we have to put in, um, and also how much motion is going to occur at either end of the lever. Okay, we determine these as what we call these classes of levers, okay, this different organizations, these are classes, um, and we use the acronym ARM or Axis Resistive Motive Force um, to help us determine the organization and the advantages that may be occurring there with that class of lever because each class of lever has its own purpose and its own advantages. Okay, so a first class lever is kind of like a seesaw. We have a motive force on one side, resistive force on one side, and then the axis is in the middle. Okay, so they're on either side, um, causing torque in opposite directions. Um, we see this in the body with um, elbow extension specifically. Okay, the triceps pull on one side, and then the resistive force of the forearm is on the opposite side. The elbow joint is in the center, um, because if you see here in this image, the Electronon process is slightly um, on one side of the joint center while the arm is on the opposite side where that uh, resistive force will be. So these are examples of first class levers in the human body. Um, these, are, these are good because they allow us to cause motion on one and then causes motion on the opposite side of that axis. So our force applied on one side causes motion on the opposite side. Um, we also see this with cervical extension. So the motive force of our um, cervical extensors or neck extensors, neck extensor muscles cause a force on one side of the axis or the center of our, of our cervical spine. And then our face causes a resistive force with gravity is pulling our face downward. That motive force pulling down on one side of the axis causes motion um, of the face either up or relaxes to allow it to move down. So we get motion on either side depending on the force that we apply. With a second class lever, okay, this gives us a torque advantage. Okay? Um, so this is our advantageous lever. Okay? This is where we have an axis, then the resistive force, and then the motive force furthest away from the axis. So this means that we, or our motive force, will always have more torque on the system than the resistive force, or more 
more of an advantage. So it will be easier for us to create more torque because our lever is longer. Well, an example of how we use this is using the push-up. In a push-up exercise, we have the axis, which would be our feet against the ground, the resistance, which would be our body weight in the center, our center of mass, and then our arms, um, which would cause a force to push us up. So that would be our example of a second class lever that we use in exercise. And we also use this as an example with plantar flexion when our ball of our foot or the heads of our metatarsals are in contact with the ground and causing rotation there. So when we're running, when we're jumping, when we're pushing off and we're walking, okay, there's a point at which our center of mass is in front of where our calves insert uh, or our plantar flexor muscles which allows us to have a force on one side, a resistive force in the middle, and then the axis on the end. Okay, this allows us to create larger amounts of torque without applying as much muscle force. So this is advantageous for us because we don't have to apply as much force to move a larger resistance. The last class or the third class lever um, has an axis, our motive force in the middle and the resistive force furthest away from that axis which means that the resistive force has the longest lever arm, which means we have a mechanical disadvantage because that resistive force will have a longer lever arm, so more capability for torque than our motive force. We see this lever most frequently in the human body. Okay? Most of our muscles insert closer to the axis than any resistive force would be applied. Um, so we're disadvantaged when it comes to force application. Um, so we, we have to produce a lot more force to create the same torque that the external resistance can or the resistive force can um, because that lever is much shorter, but it gives us an advantage for range of motion and speed of movement for the distal end of that lever or the further the piece of the lever that is furthest away from the axis um, because we only have to cause a force for a short distance or a little bit of work to allow the other end of the lever to move a larger range of motion. Okay, so at this point, if we move two inches, this side is going to move maybe 10 times that. So if that occurs in the same amount of time, we only have to move a short distance to get a large movement in the same period of time, which means that we can increase the velocity of that distal end or that further away end, um, giving us an advantage for speed of movement um, but it's a disadvantage for force. An example here for a third class lever would be our knee extension. Here, our knee joint when we're performing extension. Um, our extensors or our quads insert um, a distance away from that joint center and then the rest of our leg or the center mass of our leg, um, our lower leg, our, our tibia, our fibula, all the musculature in our foot give us a force that's further away or gravity supply further away from that axis than where our muscle, where our muscle is located. Um, giving us a disadvantage when it comes to how much force we have to create in order to create motion, but it also gives us a lot of speed of our foot or the distal end of that limb when it comes to walking, running, kicking, and things like that. Okay, um, continuing with this, when we're looking at torque as a calculation, Torque is the force applied perpendicularly times the force arm or the distance at which that force is being applied. Regardless of which force is being applied, they will each have their own torque applied to the system. If both torques are the same, okay, so motive torque and resistive torque are equal, there will be no motion or equilibrium. Whichever torque is greater will cause motion in the direction of the greater torque. Okay. And we can determine if we have a mechanical advantage based on the length of the lever arm for the motive force and the lever arm for the resistive force. This is a ratio, a mechanical advantage ratio. Um, if we have a lever arm of the motive force that is longer than the resistive force, our ratio will be greater than one. If it is greater than one, we have a mechanical advantage on that system or we don't have to apply as much force. Okay. Um, when we have a resistive force that is larger than the motive force, that means that we have a mechanical advantage of, or mechanical advantage ratio less than one. 
If we have it less than one, we have a mechanical disadvantage, which means we have to apply more force on the system than the resistive force um, does in order to apply or to create motion. Okay, so this is a ratio of our force to the resistive force necessary to initiate motion or cause motion. Um, if the mechanical advantage is, is one, then the um, advantages are equal. There's no advantage or disadvantage. Okay, we are equal on that system. Okay, so you do need to know this, put a little check mark by it. Um, torque in humans, okay, muscles attach a distance away from that joint center. So here's our bicep inserting away from our elbow joint center. And then the load of the arm would give us a resistive force in the opposite direction. Um, so all muscles produce force, which create torque at a joint. Okay, um, and then those force components or, or the amount of that or the think about it as the percentage based on the angle or the the component how much of that force is perpendicular compared to how much is not perpendicular okay, the resultant force or, or the total force is not always applied perpendicularly to the lever um, or at a right angle to um, but a proportion of it is so uh, the proportion that is at a right angle is going to be the rotational component of that force, which will be the force that creates torque. Um, the opposite end, okay, the percentage that or the proportion that is not perpendicular, that is linear um, to that lever, okay, either towards the joint or away from the joint. If that component is towards the joint, that will cause a stabilization or compression component. If it is pulling away, as you see in the other side, a non-rotary component um, that is going linear to the lever and away from the axis will cause a dislocating um, component or a destabilization component. So part of that force is either compressing or separating the joint and part of that force that the muscle is applying is causing rotation. Okay, so here's another example. Um, think about it real quick, which type of lever is this? We see axis, motive force, resistive force. The resistive force is furthest away. The motive force is in the middle. The motive is in the middle. It's a third class lever. Resistance is in the middle, second class lever. Axis in the middle, first class lever. Okay, that's how we can always run through our A, R, M. Okay. And those muscles contribute a force that creates a torque and that torque can cause or resist motion. A, an internal muscle torque or internal muscle moment, torque and moment are the same thing. Um, if the muscle torque and the joint motion are in the same direction, so we're creating a flexion torque and the limb causes flexion, okay, the joint performs flexion, we have a concentric muscle action. Okay, that is our definition of when the muscle torque and the joint movement are in the same direction. If we have, say we're creating a flexion torque, so we're trying to cause flexion at a joint, but the motion is extension or in the opposite direction. So if we try to cause flexion, but extension is the movement that occurs, that is an eccentric muscle action. Okay, so star those, those are our key terms when it comes to how our muscle is acting or how our muscle is creating torque and the motion that is being um, caused or happening at that joint. Okay, so they are, one is where if torque and motion are the same, concentric. Torque and motion are opposite directions, we have eccentric. Okay, that is in terms of the muscle torque or the motive torque or our force that we're applying. Okay, um, there are also those external torques. There's different examples of what can cause external torque. Okay, um, the ground is a great example. Ground reaction forces, the forces that the ground is applying back onto us, will cause a torque on our joints, will cause a torque on our body. Any, any external thing that we hold on to, anything that we come in contact with, even the mass of our limbs or how much our limbs weigh and where that center of mass is located or where that mass is averaged out to in a position on our limb, the further that is away, the greater external torque is going to be applied because that lever is getting further and further. 
So our muscles create internal torques. The environment and gravity really cause external torques. Okay, so let's bring it back to advantages. Okay, muscles in most cases don't have an advantage when it comes to creating torque, but because those resistive forces and those distal ends are further away from the axis than the force that we apply with our muscles, we will get greater motion from that distal end. If we have more motion in the same time, we have greater velocity. Greater velocity means greater speed of movement. Greater speed of movement means that, say, we can run faster, throw harder, um, do different external things with the environment. Our muscles don't have to shorten very far to create a lot of movement at the distal end. So think like our hands, our feet, things like that. Okay, so that influences our velocity by increasing the displacement or the distance traveled at the, of the distal end compared to the proximal end or where that muscle is attached. Okay, so important takeaways from here, muscle forces are always um, fixed at an arm or that arm length is always fixed. We can't change our insertion points. Um, so it's always there. We, we have to have that insertion distance. Um, resistive arm can change based on what we're doing, what's, what's interacting with us. Um, the longer the resistive arm, the more muscle force we're going to need to cause or resist motion. Okay, the shorter the resistive arm, the less muscle force we're going to need to cause or resist that motion. Okay, um, if we're trying to add more resistance, or make it more difficult for our muscles to work, we can add more resistance or move the resistance further away from the axis of rotation. Okay, so we can lengthen the lever arm distance to the resistive force to make the torque greater on our joint from the external environment, meaning that our muscles are going to have to work much harder to overcome that resistance and cause some motion. Okay, if you want to lessen the resistance, we can lessen the resistance in general, um, decrease the weight or the force being applied um, to that system, or we can bring that resistance closer to the axis or decrease that lever length, which will make it easier for our muscles or we have to produce less muscle force to cause um, torque to cause motion. Okay. All right, now that we've talked about torque and levers, let's talk about the motion that's occurring. Um, so we have two different types of linear motion or line-based motion, not rotational-based motion. We have rectilinear motion, which is straight line motion. And then we have curvilinear motion, which is a arced pattern or a curved pattern that could be um, going in different directions throughout its motion rather than a straight line motion. And we also have that angu angular or rotary motion that we talked about earlier. So this is where something rotates around an axis. Um, and then we combine the two and they interrelate inter with each other. Um, so angular motion of joints, say the joints in our body, cause linear motion and curvilinear motion of maybe our finger, our hand, or any point along that lever can have linear motion or curvilinear motion based on the angular motion that's occurring. Um, or that axis could have rectilinear motion while it's causing rotational motion. So think about walking. Our hip joint may have very rectilinear motion as we walk in a straight line, but there's going to be angular motion at the hip joint. Okay, that lever or our thigh is going to be rotating around the hip joint. Our knee or tibia is going to be rotating around the knee joint. Our ankle, our foot's going to be rotating around our ankle joint to cause angular motion with our bones and rectilinear motion with our entire body. So we, we interrelate the two. So they're not independent of each other. Okay, we're just looking at different pieces. Okay, the center of rotation is the axis for our joints rotation. Okay, so the center of rotation within our joint um, is the location at which that bone, that distal bone is rotating around. Um, so this can change depending on positions of the limbs, translation or, or sliding motion of one bone compared to the other, because they aren't just perfect hinges like you see the, the hinges on your door. They do have some slipping and sliding motion that occurs, but in general, we have a 
fixed point or a generally fixed point within the center of the joint. Okay, and then we quantify this motion, describe this motion using scalar and vector quantities or scalar terms, which are scalar variables, which indicate magnitude. Okay, so this is just how big or how small or how much there is of that quantity. Um, so this is an example of mass, time, um, speed. These are all examples of scalar quantities that show us how much or how fast or what's going on in a magnitude sense, but it doesn't give us any information about direction. So scalar quantities do not include direction, they only include magnitude. Vector quantities give us both magnitude and direction. They also give us point of application when we deal with forces. Um, so we have a magnitude and a direction. So how much and in what direction? Okay, so this can come with acceleration, displacement, um, forces, these are velocity also. Um, velocity is the speed of movement in a specific direction. A change in direction or a change in speed would be acceleration or a change in motion. Velocity is our quantification of motion when it comes to direction and magnitude. Okay, that direction is extremely important when it comes to how we are moving. Speed only gives us so much or scalar quantities give us a piece, vectors give us more information. Okay, displacement and distance both are terms of change in position, okay, so change in location. Um, displacement is our vector quantity, so there is a direction when it comes to displacement. Okay, so we have moved um, maybe in this example 4.24 units down and to the right gives us our displacement measure because this is a straight line distance from point A um, to point B or, or from point one to point two in a straight line. Okay, so it does not matter what happens in between, okay, within a specific time period from one point to the next would give us our displacement or our change in position in a straight line. Um, and the direction of that line will be the direction of that displacement. Distance is the measurement of the distance traveled or the amount of positions that changed over, changed over that um, amount of time. Okay, so if this is our example here that we're looking at right now, from, if I'm trying to get from A to C and I walk three units down or move three units down, three units over, I would have moved a distance of six units. But because it's just from start to end for displacement, um, and I'm looking at start to end in a straight line, it would only be 4.24 units down and to the right rather than six units um, of just six units of travel. Okay, so distance gives us the length of the measurement, but displacement tells us in what direction and exactly how far um, as the crow flies or in a straight line between the two. Angular displacement is similar to linear displacement in that it's the change in location or the change in position. Um, but angular displacement is rotational. So we're looking at degrees or radians as our unit rather than linear displacement, which would be something like inches, meters, centimeters, um, kilometers, miles, where we're looking at a linear distance or a linear change in location, linear displacement. Speed and velocity are similar. They're, they're Kind of moving on a little bit further from just displacement from change in location to change in location over a certain amount of time. Um, so how long it takes that displacement to occur is our velocity or the average velocity for that motion. So things change in location or change in position, the direction at which they changed and the rate at which they change gives us our velocity or gives us our velocity. So um, if we go back to that previous example, if it took me one second to go from A to C, okay, that would give me 4.24 units per second um, of velocity, but my speed would have been six units per second because I traveled six total units.
Okay, so speed doesn't get taken into account that straight line. It is our distance traveled divided by the time it took that distance to happen. Velocity gives us our displacement or change in location over how long it took that change of location to occur in a straight line in that direction. Okay. So now let's go into Newton's three laws. Let's go into these laws of motion um, that kind of determine what's going to happen. Here, first law is the law of inertia, which says that a body in motion tends to remain in motion at the same speed in a straight line unless acted on by a force. Or a body tends to at rest, tends to stay at rest unless acted on by a force. So what this means is that objects have a resistance to change in motion. And in order to change that motion, we have to apply force. Force is the only thing that will change motion, okay? either direction of motion or speed of motion. Okay. Inertia itself, that variable, that, that quantity tells us the resistance to change in motion or resistance to change in direction, resistance to change in um, speed or, or rate of motion, okay? Um, and bodies have that inertia or that resistance to change in force or change in motion and a force must be applied to change that motion. So forces cause motion, objects have their innate resistance to change in motion, okay? The greater mass an object has, the greater inertia that object has, which means more mass, equals more inertia, more inertia means more resistance to change in motion. So it is harder or it takes more force to change a object of more masses motion. Um, so think about this as um, moving an object. Say you want to pick up an object. An object with greater mass will have more resistance to change in its motion compared to an, a lighter object or an object with less mass. Um, so think about mass as our resistance to change in motion or as a quantity of that inertia. Okay. Um, force is required to change inertia, to change an object's resistance to change in motion. Um, so as we apply forces, we change motion. You can think about this in a sporting sense. Say you're you're the defense on the football team and you're trying to get to the quarterback. You have your offensive lineman. That offensive lineman has a resistance to change in motion or has inertia. The more mass that lineman has, the more resistance to change in motion he has. So the harder it is to get by that person. Um, our next law is the law of acceleration. So this tells us that a change in acceleration of a body or the change in motion occurs in the same direction as the force caused it to. Okay, and that change in acceleration is directly proportional, okay, which means that as acceleration goes up, it is directly proportional to force. As, for, as force goes up, acceleration goes up. As force goes down, acceleration goes down. And then causing it, or the, that force that causes it. So the change in acceleration is directly proportional to the force causing it and inversely proportional to the mass of the body, which means that the greater the mass, so say we keep force constant, if we increase the object's mass, we will decrease its acceleration or we add inertia to that object um, or we add resistance to acceleration okay, based on that force. So the the more mass that object has, the more force that needs to be applied to cause acceleration. Because acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. Okay, so it takes us some force to cause acceleration and mass is the amount of matter a body has. Okay, this gives us our resistance to alterations or changes in motion. The last law, the third law, is the law of reaction. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Or for every force applied, there is an equal force applied back in the opposite direction. So all forces must be equal okay, and in opposite directions. So every time, for example, if we step on the ground, the ground is pushing on us in the opposite direction with the same magnitude of force that we apply on the ground. Um, 
and then our motion will be in the direction that that force overcomes the inertia or overcomes the mass. So think back to our law of acceleration. Um, so if two people, or if I'm pushing against a wall, the wall isn't going to move because the wall has more inertia than the force I'm applying, but I may have less inertia than that force I'm applying. If I have less inertia than the force, that reaction force from the wall, that reaction force from the wall is going to cause my body or my mass to have acceleration or change in motion. Okay, so direction of motion always follows um, the force that overcomes the inertia. Okay, so we look at this when it comes to ground reaction force, so how much force we apply on the ground, say when we take a step when we're walking or running. Um, when we apply a force to the ground, the ground also applies a force back on us. That force that the ground applies on us is what causes our motion. So really, we're just pushing on the ground, and the ground pushes us forward. Um, or if I'm, say, I'm performing a push-up. If I'm performing a push-up and I push myself up, I'm actually just pushing down. I'm pushing the ground. The ground is pushing me up with the reaction force. They are that equal force in opposite direction. All right, now we'll look at some other forces like friction. Friction is a resistance to the sliding motion between two objects that are in contact with each other. Um, friction is always opposite motion. It will always oppose motion of two sliding bodies or two things that are sliding against each other. So think about um, someone who's ice skating. Um, there's less friction on ice compared to on the ground. Um, the less friction, the less resistance to uh, motion. Okay, so friction forces resist motion of sliding two bodies against each other, two things against each other. Um, so your feet on the ground, if you're, say you're walking around your house in socks and you have a, um, a tile or a wood floor, or a slippery floor, um, there's less friction, so there's less resistance to sliding. You may take a step and then begin to slide in your socks. Um, because there's less friction, there's less resistance of the ground and your sock against each other, so you may continue your motion. Now let's say you put some rubber, rubber soled shoes on, that rubber has greater friction against the ground, so now you step against the ground and you don't slide because there's more resistance to motion, that force is stopping your motion. Okay, this also happens in the human body, we reduce friction in most cases within the body because we don't want those two objects to have resistance sliding against each other. So if we look at our joints, um, we talked about articular cartilage before, cartilage reduces friction. Okay, if we reduce friction, it is easier to cause motion against those two things. So say your bones sliding against each other, if there's resistance to sliding, it's difficult for you to cause motion. Less resistance, easier to move. We also have things like bursa in our bodies. Bursa um, are often between connective tissue and bone, or connective tissue and other connective tissue, and they reduce friction of those two things sliding against each other. If we have more friction or resistance to motion, that friction can also cause damage to tissues because if there is motion that occurs and it slides and slides and slides, um, that sliding um, or that friction, that force of them sliding against each other could cause heat, and that heat or it could cause damage or deterioration of that tissue. Okay, moving on to some other quantities, we're, we'll talk about balance, equilibrium. Um, balance is the ability to control equilibrium or maintain a state of zero acceleration. Okay? Equilibrium is no change of speed of direction. Think of equilibrium as no acceleration. Okay. Static equilibrium is equilibrium where there is no motion. Okay. So there is no motion and we are maintaining a state of no motion. Okay. Balance itself can be static or dynamic. We can have balance or a state of zero acceleration or the control zero acceleration when we are still or when we're moving or maintain our motion without having external motion occurring. Okay, so 
balance can be both static and dynamic. Dynamic equilibrium is where all forces that are causing motion or would try to cause motion are balanced out by opposing reaction forces. So there is no change in speed or direction. Okay. Stability is that resistance to our change or disturbing equilibrium. If we have more stability, we have greater balance. Okay. Stability comes from manipulating, especially with our body when it comes to things like falling. Um, stability comes from keeping our center of gravity or center of mass within our base of support or so we're not tipping over. Okay. If our center of mass moves outside of our base of support, it creates a torque on our body. Our center of mass is the resistance. Our ground is the, or the ground is the axis, our foot in the ground, and will cause a torque that could cause us to tip and fall over. Okay. If we want to maintain a standing position or maintain balance where we're not having gravity as the external force causing us to move outside of equilibrium or where no other forces are causing us to move in that direction, we have to maintain that center of gravity within the base of support. Okay. So we can do that by expanding the base of support. If we have more base of support, we have greater stability because we have greater resistance to um, tipping or falling. Um, you can also add more points of contact. You can even lower the center of gravity within that base of support. So things like squatting down, the lower you are to the ground, the shorter that lever of your center of gravity to your foot or the axis, the less likely or the less ability you have to fall over or lose balance. Okay. Muscles cause those forces that could cause us to move um, to maintain balance. They can also cause us to create motion okay, or create acceleration of our, of our body by creating internal forces within our body by contracting pulling on a tendon, pulling on the bone. If that torque that our muscle causes around the joint overcomes the external resistance torque that's being applied, we cause motion because motion follows torque or force that is greater. So we will cause our body to move. Maybe it's to raise our arm. Maybe it's to lift our arm up. Maybe it's to walk, take a step. Maybe it's to swing, throw, move. And then stronger muscles are able to produce more force compared to weaker muscles. Stronger muscles can create more torque around joints, which means they can cause more motion or they can cause faster motion or they can maintain motion or resist motion better than weaker muscles that can't produce as much force. The strength of a muscle comes with the force that it can apply onto the bone to create torque, to create motion. If forces themselves are a push or pull on a body that attempts to cause motion or cause a change in motion or a change in shape. Okay, without forces, there would be no motion. Okay, so force itself is the product of mass times acceleration. Okay, so it's the product of the quantity of matter of the object multiplied by its change in motion. That would be the force um, or the mass is the matter of the body would be equal to the acceleration or the change of motion divided by the force. We talked earlier about Newton's second law, which stated that acceleration is equal to force divided by mass or directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass. Okay, so these are all interlinked into each other. Okay, the greater mass Okay, the greater the force could be with the same acceleration. The greater the acceleration, the greater the force. Okay, so these all play against each other. Okay, the last one we'll talk about is momentum or the quantification of motion. The quantity of motion comes with the mass times the velocity or the product of mass and velocity. Okay, greater momentum, the greater resistance to change in inertia or greater resistance to change in motion um, because now that object that object's mass is moving at a greater rate of change of position or greater velocity um, so if two opponents say two people um, are coming towards each other one person has more mass the other person has less mass and they're both moving at the same velocity but opposite directions 
the person with greater momentum will dictate the direction that those two will move when they collide. So here in this image, these two hockey players collide. Um, the avalanche player may have more mass if those two er, assume that they have the same velocity coming towards each other, but in opposite directions. The one with more mass will cause them to move in the direction of more momentum. So motion follows greater momentum in collisions. Okay. Um, so for you, your study, try to apply these different terms, these different topics um, to your motion, to motion you see, um, to motion that you cause or you see others cause. I'm going to try and think of some examples and try to bring them to class so that we can talk about some of those examples. All right. Thanks for watching and have a great day.